when your your child, what's his name, her name? Adam. Well, okay, when Adam is close by you, sometimes you have these walls, but sometimes you just give him love energy. Right. And he gives you love energy. Right. Okay, there's a process that I want to talk about called endogene. Endogene is about taking externally oriented love that I'm having like if I'm addicted in a love addicted relationship and redirecting that love like a muscle back to my precious child within. It's called endogene. Anybody ever heard of it? Tell me how. how yeah, I went to, I took a uh, love addicts and a survivor's class over at uh, Kim Melody's mm -hmm. Meadows. Mm -hmm. And I had never done any inner child work before. And they actually had me like go back to my inner child, put a, um, visualize it, put it underneath my chair, and then work with the child, putting the child back into my heart so that when anything would happen, that I have a real big abandonment issue, um, that I was taking care of that, that child as an adult. Okay. So now what I'm hearing you say is I you are really honoring your precious child within, and you've heard of endogene before? I think that's what it was called. That's interesting, because I created the word. Oh, because it, it's not taking your inner child? Maybe she's... But that's okay. It is, that, that is the process. Yeah. So the Maybe process is time. taking externally orientated love and redirecting that love with healthy boundaries back to my precious child within. Okay, and we'll talk about that later. How can you have unhealthy boundaries with yourself? Are you protecting yourself from yourself? Uh, I'm going to address that right now. If I had healthy boundaries, they would look like this. It would be kind of like I had a big jelly jar, a Smucker's jelly jar. I took the label off, I cleaned it out, and I put it down over my head. My jelly jar is real thick. The glass part of it is very thick, and, and the glass is bulletproof. I can see out, you can see in, but I'm very protected. That's my external boundary. My external boundary is about the distance that I'm going to be from you, and it protects me from you, and it also contains me from offending you. My external boundary... Um, is about physical touch. There's two types of touch. Nurturing touch, like in holding a child, and sexual touch. Both of this type of need that we all have as humans is up, is up to me to get met. It's not for me to be in this world to brush Jerry's hair in the morning or for her to brush my teeth. We're all here to take care of our own needs. There's a, a process that is called childhood when we learn how to self-parent or to grow into maturity so we can parent ourselves in a healthy way. Um, I miss that process. Okay, so this is the external boundary, and it's about distance and closeness. I also have another boundary. It's my internal boundary. My internal boundary is about part of my reality, my thinking, my feeling, and my actions or lack of actions. My reality is made up of my body, my thinking, my feeling, and my behaviors. My internal boundary kind of works like a dentist's flap jacket, except it has little doors in it, and only I can open the doors. And I open them in when I want to feel, or I keep them shut when it's not appropriate for me to feel. Like if I walk into the Ramona homeless shelter, and uh, somebody's throwing a mattress, and I know that the mattress has nothing to do with me, then I can keep my boundaries my feeling boundaries shut and say, isn't that, I can note what's happening, isn't that interesting? 
there's crazy making going on in here and I have nothing to do with it, so I really don't have to have any feelings about it. My internal boundary has little doors in it that only I can open them, and I open them in when I want to feel or I keep them shut when it's not appropriate for me to feel. In between my internal boundary and my external boundary is my higher power. Uh, this is like the 12-step program higher power. God as I understand God, not God as you understand God for me. In the 12-step program, our higher power is a very personal spiritual experience that we have or that we don't have. So what I'm sharing is actually step one, two, and three of the 12-step AA encoded program and also step 10, 11, and step 12. Without boundaries, I can't really work any of these steps. Okay, so in between my internal boundaries and my external boundaries is my higher power, as I understand my higher power. Not the higher power of my childhood. <clears throat> my higher power cannot be my partner. You know how the kids say not today? <coughs> Higher power cannot be my, my partner, my kids, teachers, pretend gurus. You know, all guru really means is G U R U. <laughs> and once I get off alcohol and drugs, I can go on this long for me journey to find myself. But as long as I'm using drugs, I'm not able to be in the present moment to be available with my own feelings. Higher power can't be uh, police, right Sandy? Right. <laughs> or my cat or dog. <laughs> can't be animals, can't be friends. Can it be A? I've heard people use it as an A, A is their higher power. It's up to you. Because you know what, I really hear God or higher power speak through people because when we come together, there is a spiritual sacred space that I call a, a safe sacred space that happens in meetings of, of AA and 12-step programs because we're all in an unusual way respecting each other's boundaries. Unless in some meeting you have to go happen to go to there's crosstalk or advice given, which is really not allowed in any twelve step program. Okay. The God of my childhood was first my parents. This is my mom, this is my dad. This is me. I'm from a place called Strawberry Ridge. Fifty acres. Here I am, this little kid <coughs> with uh purple flowers, fascinated by flowers. My dad gave me what he had. And my mom gave me what she had. His dad killed himself when my dad was three. My mom's mom died in my mom's childbirth. So they parented me. They just adored me. They thought this is an incredible bouncing baby lesbian what they thought. And unfortunately all they had to give me was what, what they had. They loved me to the best of their ability, but they didn't know how to parent. They hadn't had healthy parental modeling themselves, so they had no way of really being a healthy parent to me. So as a very small child, I became, in a way, my own parent. And one <coughs> of the things that happened was that they were my God when I was a kid, tiny tot. And the way that they controlled me was by shaming me, blaming me, finding fault with me, uh, reward and punishment.
and the biggest of all, to control me, they made me guilty. So when I say higher power, I don't mean the God of my childhood that was shaming, fault-finding, blaming, um, judge, judgmental, judging. This higher power in AA and Codependence Anonymous is a non-judgmental. This higher power loves me and accepts me for my wonderful preciousness just the way I am. Just as you are all accepted for your preciousness just the way you are. So it's not a matter of performing anymore. This is sometimes called the patriarchy. Hi. Are you new? What's your name? Don. Don. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -oh. That's my name too, Don. Nice to meet you. Okay, uh, are you in the program? Yeah, I just got in residency. All right, well, welcome. We all welcome you in. Okay. So, this patriarchy situation is about control. And the control is this shame, blame, fault, guilt, reward, punishment. When you hear this stuff going on in the house, this is what I call jackal talk. And this is a pattern from childhood, because that's all many of our parents knew how to give us was what they had been given, which is jackal language. All jackals are really unarticulated giraffes. It's just that sometimes if you come to me to bring me a gift, you got a gift here, but when you're, when you're talking to me and say, look it, I got a gift for you, Dawn, and you come across with judgmental language, like I feel distrustful, or betrayed, or abused, or rejected, or uh, <coughs> devalued by you, I'm going to have to have my giraffe ears on when I'm listening to you to hear the gift that you have in your message. So it's not just about that I can talk giraffe, which I'm just learning how to talk it, which is the language of non-shaming, non-blaming, non-violent, no fault, no guilt, the language of being in the moment, communication skills, non-violent. So I have, often, I have to put on my giraffe ears to hear a message that's coming with Jekyll delivery. So there's a lot to this. And what this looks like, if I really want to have boundaries and clear communication, what this looks like, I think communication intimacy is not about sex at all. Sex has nothing to do with intimacy. I think communication is about having healthy boundaries, two peoples having healthy boundaries, and having a kind of a spiritual energy that goes in between two people with two healthy boundaries. And when this happens, there's something could, it feels like a miracle to me, but it's not a miracle, it's quite easy to do. But when this happens, we have intimacy. And the intimate, the spiritual boundary is about having boundaries and not having boundaries at the same t time. It's like I'm really, really close to you, and yet I'm really, really separate from you at the same time. Any questions so far on communication, on this spiritual connection? What's the matter? Go ahead. So she she was a a offering me a pet, and I said, no, I was just okay. listening. There's one that's not being used if you want to use that one. Any question on this? You ever heard of this before? Is that what we want to start <coughs> for then? I don't know, because I'm not going to say what, what is in your life. I'm going to... Okay, because I don't know if I wrote it down properly. So I have having boundaries and then not having boundaries, but it's not an enmeshment? No, it's okay. far different from anything that I've ever experienced in my childhood or in my adulthood. It's 
about the ability to be interdependent instead of being dependent or anti-dependent. And actually, intimacy is kind of fun. In, in a way, it is kind of fun. And, and I think it's emotional, it's almost emotional, spiritual food. Without intimacy, I'm not sure that, that I could survive. And that's probably why I was so suicidal for so, so many years. What's all, your definition of intimacy? I was actually suicidal all my life. What, what do you mean? Can you give me a definition of intimacy? Yeah, I have it all written down right now. But let me put it on hold, and I will give that to you. Okay, so any question on what I'm saying right now? Cindy? No, I was rubbing my eye. Okay. You can only else? do this for so long and then your eye starts. You can take wandering. a break if you want. Okay. If I don't have healthy boundaries, I digressed a little into giraffe language. Let me get back to boundaries. If I don't have healthy boundaries with these components, internal, external boundary, higher power, I'm going to be in a bit of a bind because I won't be able to protect myself. When stuff happens out in the kitchen, I might fall into regression, or I might fall into old patterns because I'm under stress and I don't know necessarily what's coming, what is going down. Post-acute withdrawal? Post-acute withdrawal, absolutely. <clears throat> and that's not about the kitchen stuff, that's about my life of being traumatized and not having boundaries and not knowing how to protect myself and how to contain myself in an appropriate way. Is that where the tears come in too? Could they? Yeah. yeah. It's the trauma? Yeah. I'm guessing that you're feeling pain right now. You want, are you willing to share what's going on? <coughs> I don't know. You know, Jerry, this whole process is a real big, giant grieving process. Because when I discovered what I had lived through and what had been done to me, with me, instead of being celebrated in this life, how I had been by the patriarchy denied, and even, you know, for a long time, girl children were not celebrated. Girl children were murdered at birth in lots of places of this earth. I'm not saying that's happening right now, but celebration of a female child is new. So I'm, I'm really guessing that your losses are, are heavy for you. I can't explain it. Okay, if I don't have boundaries, I might look like this. No boundaries. I might look like this. Walls. What kind of walls do you think I would use if I didn't know how to have healthy boundaries? What kind? Picket fence. Picket fence. Right on. Fear, anger. Okay. Fear, a wall of fear to distance myself from you. Anger. Anything else? BWA. Back walking away. Got a black belt in my boundaries class, Cindy. Mm. Okay. Anybody else? What Silence. Kind of, <laughs> anybody else? What kind of walls might I use? Niceness. Niceness. Right. Pleasant. Pia calls this a wall of pleasant. Could drugs and alcohol be a wall? Yeah, right. God bless you. God bless you. Excuse me. So let's put in here addiction for a wall. Avoidance. Right. Okay. And the last type is sometimes I have boundaries, like in work. When I worked with the post office, I was really good in the work that I did. I, uh, I, uh, God bless you. I did front lobby post offices, the design work to make them more beautiful for people to come in who had to wait in line for the post, at the post office. I loved what I did. Okay, so I had pretty good boundaries there, except when it came to station managers and men who would be really pissed at me and they'd say things like how come you got this job and my brother-in-law didn't he does signs great 
he does lobby directory systems wonderful how come a woman has this sometimes my boundaries would work really good with my children sometimes they wouldn't sometimes my boundaries wouldn't work good with my parents there was a time when I would go home and I would feel like I was four years old the minute I walked through the door. Anybody had that feeling? Boy, that's a trip, I'll tell you, you know. Here you are, 40, 50 years old, and you have that deja vu about being real tiny again. Okay. Excuse me. No, you're, you're excused. Okay, any questions on three states <coughs> if I don't have healthy boundaries? Or any comments? Dawn. How are you feeling right now? Confused. Okay. What is a higher feeling under the confusion? I'm going to say just confused. I, I just, I'm scared. scared. Put I'm your hand over your heart. Just put your hand. I'm scared. <laughs> so I'm hearing that you're really scared. Um, Okay, anybody else? Any questions on this? You saw another good one, another good wall was confusion. Yeah, but it's Chaos. secondary. <laughs> confusion is like anger, it's a secondary feeling. It has really nothing to do with who I am. Once I have the idea of boundaries. If you didn't have boundaries drawn through your life, what boundaries did you use? What did your boundaries look like? Or feel like? They <laughs> I was I was not. I, I covered it up to a lot. Nobody ever thought they could bother me. I was voted takes life most easily in the ninth grade at Sedgwick uh, Junior High School in West Hartford, Connecticut. And I had been sexually molested between the ages of 7 and 11 years old. And I really know, knew how to hide. Can relate to what you're saying. Okay. Um, Is the panic a wall? Could be, huh? Mm. Okay, where'd the other uh, board go to? Oh, it's right behind here. Okay. Why are boundaries important? Why is why am I telling you all this? What? What? Why? why Lauren? To protect ourselves. Yeah. Well, why is that so important? To protect me, who will. So I hear Sandy saying, if you don't protect you, who will? What else? So, so we can live life and not have to use drugs or alcohol. Uh -huh. So you can be comfortable within your own skin. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, <laughs> what did you say? I said, this girl should eat. My stomach is growling. <laughs> Do you want to go up to the kitchen? And get oh, some? no, I'm fine. <laughs> no, okay. Are you, are you new? Uh, yeah. I've been here for about three weeks. Oh, that's good. What's your name? Bridget. Bridget. Uh -huh. Glad you're here. I'm gone, and I'll be here all the month of July, so I'll okay. be seeing you again. Um, boundaries are important for a couple of reasons. Um, and all the reasons that you said. The pain of codependency, for me anyway, got so intense eight years ago that I was very suicidal. And when I started to get well, I started to have homicidal feelings. Um, recently, there was uh, a good example of sex and love addiction and alcohol drug addiction. Gambling um, is a... a an ex-girlfriend of a man who shot a woman to death about a month and a half ago, two months ago. Uh, and he shot her to death in every hole of her body. Sometimes, several times. So I really don't take boundaries lightly. And when I think about uh, Nazi Germany and seven or eight million people Jews, lesbians and gays, Czechoslovakians, Polarks, uh, Protestants, Catholics being eliminated in Nazi Germany during the Second World War. I don't, I don't take boundaries lightly. I'm very um, 
I might, I might sound like I have a smooth presentation, but in my heart, I am uh, real clear on what can happen if we don't have healthy boundaries. Um, last week, or a week and a half ago, a woman who had been in my ACA 12-step group for three years uh, was bludgeoned to death in Ramona, beaten to death in Ramona. Actually, Dorothy and I never came to one of my boundaries groups, but we spent quite a bit of time together. Um, and she could have been any of us. In my, in my thinking, uh, we're all really lucky. I, I'm lucky to be alive. And I find that you all are very um, courageous because you're taking a step, God bless you, from what you know, where you've been living most of your life, using alcohol and drugs to self-medicate, or eating disorders, or gambling, or sex and love addiction, whatever you've been using to medicate so that you don't feel the pain of all of this shame. You've decided for whatever reason to come into recovery. So that's thrilling to me, because that means to me that I'm not alone with my boundaries. There may be other people who really want to honor their own boundaries and want to honor my boundaries. And that to me is, um, is like we could actually create a peaceful world. We really could create a world that was filled with nonviolence, one by one. It all happens, this would happen one by one. Okay, so after I have boundaries, something can happen inside of me with a sponsor where I could actually begin to build self-esteem. Not too much can happen without <coughs> boundaries. But if I develop boundaries, I can begin to build self-esteem from the inside out. Other esteem is important. But self-esteem can't really be replaced, and it's something that I needed my parents or my surrogate parents to give me when I was a child, and they didn't have it to give. And if any of us are tiny tots here, the messages we give about affirmations instead of, I am beautiful, <coughs> I am valuable, the message to give myself is, you are beautiful, you are valuable. So the pronouns need to be in you. If I, if I could actually imagine that I had my precious child within in my arms, and I was talking to Dawn, I was saying I'm a smoker. And I'm out there puffing away, and I got my precious little Dawn beside me. Can you see me putting the cigarette in, in a little six-month-old baby's mouth? I don't think so. And if I were actually talking to this child, I would say, you are precious, and you are beautiful. Who's like the grandchild homecoming thing? I would say more like creating love in this sense. Creating love is the most recent series. So the affirmation is more of a mirror effect. Yeah. Mirror? Mirroring? Meaning, yeah, saying, yeah. it means one thing saying I to other people when we're around saying them, but we're really saying it to ourselves, so you want to say you. Okay, so, so like um, I say, uh, I accept myself as I learn the truth in my affirmations, I would say you accept yourself as you learn the truth, yeah. or as I learn the truth. And also, keep it real simple. If you've got a little tot inside you, which a lot of us do, you're precious. You, you are precious. It doesn't matter what anybody else is saying. You are precious. And when you look in the mirror, because that's the way that I was instructed mm -hmm. to do it, mm -hmm. should I still say I then? Because now I'm really having a problem. I've got had to get used to saying I. But I'm looking at myself. <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Because okay. <laughs> you know what? I mean? <laughs> Recovery about having boundaries is about making choices oh. and be self being self determining from the inside out. In other words. I no longer look to someone or something outside me to tell me what my choices are in my life. I come here by choice because I enjoy you. I really honor you. Uh, I'm not paid. I have to do service work as part of the 12-step program, and I get to choose where I go to do service work, just as you will get to choose where you go to do service work. 
So recovery for me today is about choices, personal choices from the inside out. I'm not waiting for somebody to come along and fall off an apple cart and say, Dawn, you can do this. I am who I am today. You are who you are today. There is no one outside me today to tell me to brush my teeth. I tell myself, little Dawn, you brush your teeth if I'm going to be parenting my little kid. Does self-esteem and self-centeredness have anything in common? or like? There's two types of judgments. <coughs> in this shame, Jekyll talk, there's a judgment that I can't live with, and that's this control, shame, blame, fault, guilt, patriarchy, or matriarchy, but mostly patriarchy. With this kind of Jekyll talk, I can't live with this. I cannot live with this because the pain of this is too intense. So I have to self-medicate, and the way I would self-medicate is through some addictive process, through mental illness, through physical illness. DSM-3 causes physical illness. We surface the pain, uh, somatoform illness. We surface the pain, the emotional, spiritual pain is so intense, we surface it as a physical illness. Okay. So, and now I'm, t I'm talking right now about the choices. Only my own reality means that I need to make choices. This is about choices. Knowing my needs and wants and acting moderately in all my affairs. Okay, once I'm al off of alcohol or dr <clears throat> drugs or prescription or eating disorders or I've stopped gambling, I'm not risk-taking driving around in my car in an empty tank of gas thinking that I'm going to get someplace because I'm my own mm -hmm. higher power and I don't really know yet about this higher power, that my higher power is not another person and I am not my own higher power. I don't really know that yet. I haven't really gotten it yet because I'm the one that's been taking care of me all my life. So I may very well think that I am my higher power. And I need to get that there is a higher power outside of me that is not me and not you and not my family members. And that has to do with page 63 of the big book. You know, and really working the steps, getting a hold of a sponsor who knows what they're talking about, who's not going to be shaming. You know, I didn't have that when I came to AA. I, I had to teach my sponsors about codependency. Mm -hmm. They simply did not know, and they were very shaming to me. Okay, there's a thing that happens when we really, we, we not, don't necessarily have to stop smoking, but we've got to know that if we're going to be eating at 3 o'clock in the morning, sneaking into Jerry's kitchen down here, we've got to know we've got something happening. We, we, got to, we need to know that we're not like Lily Bitty Mice just sneaking around getting cheese and crackers, that we may have an eating disorder. We need to at least know what's going on. If we're having a, um, some candy bar, like 3 o'clock every afternoon, we take a walk up to when we get off of our restriction time up to the little thing we buy a candy. It's not that I have to stop eating the candy, but at least I need to be aware of what I'm using to distort and distract myself from feeling my feelings in the moment. Because what I'm talking about, having boundaries, means that I'm going to tumble, fumble, and bumble into this moment, whether we want to be here or not. We're kind of stuck with each other for right now. But you're going to like boundaries. I like them. You know, I get to practice them with you. I get to learn more. I'm here sharing boundaries because I want to learn about boundaries. Incredible things happen inside me with the interchange that I have with you all here about boundaries. Wendy and, and Sandy did an incredible uh, sharing about boundaries. When Wendy confronted Sandy, she said, I want to know you. You know, I saw all kinds of things happening in Sandy's face, very tight. What do you mean? You, I am me. What do you mean? And Wendy was, Wendy, you were crying that day. You said, I, we, we care about you. We want to be your friends. And that, that connection to me was so powerful that day 
that I really got to see that this spiritual communication connection was real. Because I couldn't see the connection, but when I saw you two working, I saw that this spiritual connection is real. And you know what? It's not just one person. <coughs> if I'm really going to have a spiritual connection, i got to say that the person receiving has to be spiritually present in the moment and not loaded on drugs or alcohol or not thinking about when we're going to eat or our next boyfriend or whatever's coming down the pipe. But really, it's two connecting tubes. One to listen, which takes a lot of energy to be present, and one to deliver whatever the message is going to be. So intimacy is a two-way sharing that can go on between human beings when we have boundaries. I got a good example of it uh, this weekend. I've been communicating with someone for a few weeks over the phone, and they've been inviting me to two-step dance lessons for them to pay for. Mm -hmm. So I talked to them Sunday morning, and they said, well, tell you what, there's a gathering over here at Kenny's Motorcycle Show. So I figured, well, ah, safe turf. I can kind of scope the person out and, and get to know them and all. And when I had dinner, and they brought me home, and one of the first things out of their mouth when I got home was, you better take me to your bedroom. And I says, oh, wait a minute here. <laughs> I'm just getting to know you. I'd like to get to know you. And, and they pop back right away with, oh, my God, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it to sound like a one-night stand. Mm -hmm. But it shows through learning, through the process of learning, how I was able to mm -hmm. put them in their place, so to speak. So what I'm hearing no. you say is, because you have boundaries today, yeah. you were able not to jekyll the other person, but to see them as who they are and still contain yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your Instead sharing. Instead of coming off with the, how dare you? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it sounds to me, Sandy, like you're really seeing your sexuality as a healthy part of you, too. And you're yeah. not disowning that anymore. A couple things I need to say about choices. <clears throat> if I'm not getting loaded on alcohol or drugs or whatever else I'm using, I have the opportunity to be in the moment i got to know my needs and wants. Needs are food, clothing, shelter, my need for emotional nurturing. If I'm just a new alcoholic coming on off the street, I need to have dental. I could probably very easily be self-medicating uh, my pain because I have pain in my mouth, so I need to get to a dentist. Uh, if I'm a crystal addict, my teeth could be rotten. I need to get to a dentist so that I don't have to go through all the pain that I'm going through. Um, need for financial information. None of us that I know of, correct me if any woman has been given financial information on how to take care of yourself. I was taught you grow up, find a man, any man will do, you get married, and they take care of you. Any man will do. That's, you know, that's tough on men, too, because they're going through the very same thing. And in my mind, men have different uh, gender, different sexuality. But they have to take care of themselves, too, just like us. And it's tough if they don't know how to take care of themselves because they're codependent. <coughs> they have all the same needs that we have as human beings. Okay. Wants are different from needs. Wants bring me joy. Wants are things that are really spiritually important in my life. If I don't have wants, I might not want to get up in the morning. I sometimes wonder, why am I getting up in the morning? I'm in a lot of physical pain. Last Friday, I went in for a mouth lesion uh, that I have, uh, where I may have uh, cancer. So I had a biopsy done. Tonight, I go for a CAT uh, scan after I leave here to see. Now, I have a lot of physical pain, so I'm thinking, why am I doing this? And also, in another thing, I can't always focus on that I can remember my own pain and know that you too might have pain similar to what I have. You know? But one of the things I would really be sad about is if I couldn't come here. If for some reason this lesion was on the outside and you would judge me as being ugly and maybe you wouldn't want to listen to me. Who, who's that lady who comes here to share sometime? Edna? Edna? Yeah. I, I'm getting old. I'm 50. You, and look at my legs, you know. They're not like beautiful legs. Maybe you're judging me. I, I don't know, you know. I don't know. 
But I'm here in the present moment, and I'm giving you the best that I have to give of my own recovery. How you receive me is how you receive me. I can only tell you, I hope that you're receiving me without judgment, because I'm presenting to you without judgment, that I really care about you, that my giving to you is a way to give to myself. Okay, moderation is something that I want to cover. Very important. If I'm not distorting my feelings to distract myself from feeling my feelings in the moment in one of these ways. Oh, let me finish once. What kind of a want might I want? A, want, a small want what might be what kind of car I'll drive. What a big want might be who my partner will be. How many children I'll have. A small want might be what kind of house I'll live in. So. You need to write out in your inventory your want list, just like you write out a fears list. After you've been through your work and your steps with your sponsor, then you write out a want list and a needs list, because you need to know all this information to be your own loving parent. Another thing that I can use to distract myself from feeling my feelings in the moment is a game. And it's a game I call creating crises. And the creating crisis is, is about playing the victim, rescuer, or the perpetrator. And when I do this, what will happen is I can distract myself from feeling my feelings in the moment by blaming you, which is what happened in the kitchen. You got in touch with how you've been blamed all your life for not doing something, whatever it was. And that's part of this shame, blame, fault, guilt, and control. So, to play the victim, rescuer, perpetrator, or offender is a way to distract myself from feeling my feelings in the moment. It's a way to bomb myself from the meadows. He calls this bombing myself. So stop bombing yourself. Stop jekylling. Whenever you think about blaming someone else, jekylling them, having jekyll ears on, or jekylling with the mouth, stop. I'm, I'm asking you to stop if you would be willing. Because if you knew the intensity of the pain of the person that you're sharing with, you would be a lot gentler with that person. Um, yeah. I do that a lot. And I don't like it. I'm going to be dropping to my knees and praying about it. Yeah. But how do you just stop? I don't understand. I guess I'm supposed to replace it with something. What I would, would hope for is even though you might not be able to talk to the person that you're jacking with here in the house because feelings come up that are heated and they're also reenactment of childhood core trauma so they're not even necessarily about this moment find someone who is not necessarily like when i walked in that night was jerry and linda in the kitchen your arm was bleeding you were so frustrated you hit something Jerry could talk with me. I could be present. Find someone who can be present for you. Hopefully someone who's not involved in the pain of the moment. And then work through it. And that this is a great area right here that we have where we can work through the pain. Whatever I say and do is usually more about me and my history than it is anything to do with you doesn't look like it in the moment, but that's the truth. Then there are skills. The skills would be, giraffe skills might be, I'm wondering if you would be willing to give me some time out. You could maybe have a signal where you cross your fingers and say to one of the women here, um, I'm having a lot of feelings come up that's not necessarily about what's happening between us. You have an expression on your face. What's wrong? Um... What's wrong? Oh, or what's right? I'm interested. Oh. I was writing a book in my head. So you were writing a book in your head? I, I was just off somewhere. 
You know, you can lay down. Are you tired? Oh, no, 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 I'm not tired. <laughs> <laughs> but my wish, I was just kind of, uh, I just kind of took a vacation out to the clouds for a moment. I was retired. <laughs> I do that. Again. You can do that. It's fine. It's fine. And if, if there's any pregnant women here or anyone who is uncomfortable, there's a sofa over there, so you're welcome to lay down. I'm coming again. I'll come three or four times this month, so don't worry about missing me. Um, you're looking at the clock, Lauren. Do you have yeah, to go to the bathroom? Yeah, I have an interview at 3.30. Oh. So. Oh, you want to go? I'm so glad to see you. Well, yeah. You want to hang around for a minute? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. Okay, let's get back to this victim, rescuer, perpetrator. This has to be stopped because what I'm doing is creating a crisis inside my head. And it's a way not to feel my feelings in the moment, to distract myself. See, I'm not getting loaded off of alcohol and drugs anymore, but I, can, I, I don't even have to get out of bed. And I can create this crisis in my head. I don't know. Anybody else here can do that? <laughs> a couple more people. Okay so. okay, so the idea is to stop this. And maybe journal on it. Write down, a, write down, what am I really feeling? Rather than blaming somebody else, what am I really feeling? Usually, this is a little process, this giraffe talk, called going under my hat. And this is what it's about. Let's say I have a hat that I go under. Something happens, and I go under my hat, and I say, uh, God damn, I can't believe what that person is doing there. Such a jerk. You know? And I do that all inside myself. I don't say this to the other person. Anybody ever said anything like that? Yeah, oh, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that way I'm not offending you. I, I've got my boundaries. I'm not offending you. I'm under my own hat, and I'm honoring my feelings. Man, I feel I feel distressed about this, and I don't like this. I feel yeah. offended or whatever. Who the hell do they think they are? Right. The next <laughs> thing is, what's the higher feeling? Because anger is always a secondary feeling. So what's the higher feeling? For me, a lot of times it's fear. Fear that maybe um, I'll be, uh, you won't like me, or maybe I won't be able to live up to whatever your expectations are. It might be sadness might be loneliness. But find the real feeling. Bye, Lauren. And the, next, and the next part is, underneath this, what do you wish would happen with that person? What do you wish would happen with that person? Pie in the sky. The sky's the limit. What do you really want to have happen with this person? Communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no, you don't have to tell them either. It's just, you could say, I really wish you know, that things would be resolved between us. It, it doesn't have to be as specific. Then go down to the last one is specifically. And right now, what I really want is, and then you say right now, what I really would like is, I'm really hoping that we can make a connection. And I'm feeling uh, distant from you. And so I'd like, I want, I'm wondering if you would mind if I take a few minutes, or if maybe an hour, or if we meet four hours from now, and we get together again and discuss this again. Because I really want to be present, and I'm, I'm at my wit's end right now. I'm wondering. Instead of saying, telling other people, use the language I'm guessing, I'm wondering, or I'm imagining. Because I can't really read your mind, and you can't read mine. None of us can. Okay, what does this all have to do with the steps? There are values hidden in the steps, and these values allow me to have integrity. And because I have integrity, I can walk through a lot of things that are very painful with dignity, and I can also experience a lot of joy in my life today that I didn't used to be able to experience. So there's a real gift in having boundaries. And the gifts that I see hidden in the steps have to do with honesty. Not cash register honesty. The first three years in AA and Al-Anon, I secretaried a lot of meetings. I was living in my car. I didn't fit in at Serenity House. I knew I wouldn't fit in up here. You know how we all have those feelings. Is this true? Yeah. So I secretaried meetings. <laughs> and I juggled funds, mm -hmm. embezzled. I always covered my funds, but I juggled. Robbed Peter to pay Paul to survive. I ate out of garbage cans. So when I talk about honesty, I don't mean honesty cash register. I mean from my heart, from the inside out, with my boundaries, honesty. It's 
self-honesty. The second value that's hidden in the 12 steps has to do with hope. Hope that I can be restored to integrity, sanity, holiness, wholeness. The third value is faith. These are values that I see. Other people may have other values. Faith that I can replace this terror that I used to fear whenever I was in bars or drinking. I never knew what, when the other shoe was going to drop. With a conscious contact connection with my higher power. You taking off, JJ? Yeah, I have an appointment with my base. It's good, good to see you. It's good to see you. I'll see you next week. Okay. The value of the fourth and fifth step is about courage. Not the courage to face you, but the courage to face myself. Five is also courage. Six is willingness. Seven is humility. Humbly ask my higher power. That's not humiliation. It's humility that I am teachable, that I'm not God, that I might learn something from you if you would be willing to share with me. The value of the eighth step for me is accountability. Eighteen years and younger, it's about going back and holding people who abused me or neglected me or traumatized me or molested me or incested me accountable. I am a precious child of the universe. I had a right not to be molested. I had a right to grow into maturity in a comfortable way. So do all of us here. So it's holding people who have violated me accountable. Do this with a therapist, with a sponsor, with a friend who is your guide, your spiritual advisor. I use John Bradshaw for my spiritual advisor. The ninth step value or principle is responsibility. The 10th, 11th, and 12th Again, is responsibility. Working steps one through nine in the moment for the rest of my life. Continue to take personal inventory and when wrong, promptly admitted it. I may never be prompt. It takes me three years to admit I'm wrong. I'm from a perfectionistic family. And 12 is charity. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry the message to people who are still dying and suffering. To practice these principles, values, and all my affairs workaholism, eating disorders, gambling, whatever my addictive processes are. I want to close with a quick story about boundaries. A friend of mine I owe $1,400 to, his name is Ivan. He does seminars all over the world. He was waiting in a airport, and he came in, he saw a lady there. He, he, he also, it was real crowded. Someone was selling some cookies, and the cookies smelled good. And he doesn't know about boundaries or what I do or anything. No. So I was thinking maybe he had a little eating disorder going on here. Anyway, so he checked in. He bought a little bag of, of five cookies. He sat down. He got his newspaper out next to this lady. It was the only empty space. And he started to read his newspaper. Pretty soon, doggone, he looked over. It's kind of out of the side of his mouth, and she's getting into his bag of cookies. Can you believe that? He says to me, almost. He says, can you believe? I said, God, no, where was this? He said, in France. I said, France, that explains it, you know. No, it doesn't explain it. So then he took a cookie. And then he continued reading his newspaper. And then he looks over and she's taking another cookie. He said, Dawn, can you believe this? God, I said, no, I can't believe this, Ivan. This is incredible. So then it's time for him to take his, his flight. So he gets up to leave. He folds up his newspaper. And he says, you know what she did as I was getting up to leave? She took, I put the bag of, the empty bag of cookies down. She picked them up, opened it up, and took the crumbs out and put it in her mouth. I said, come on, Ivan. He said, yeah, that's what happened. And so then he said, I got up to leave, and I know she was getting up to leave, and I started walking on. And what happens? He says, you know how something makes you want to look back? I said yes, but I, I didn't know what he was talking about. I was just trying to be nice to him. You know, I wanted to hear the story. So he says, well, I turned around to look back, and I noticed that my bag of cookies was where I was sitting. Ah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. So when we're working with boundaries, be gentle. <laughs> be gentle and loving and kind to ourselves, our precious child within, and also be gentle and loving and kind to people you don't know about bombs. <laughs>
because we need to be teaching this stuff in a gentle experience may help you give you some very valuable tools in obtaining and keeping healthy boundaries. I'm not really quite sure how it will affect you, but I know personally it has changed my life. And so now I'm very pleased and honored to introduce to you the Boundaries and Giraffe Talk Self Love Workshop by Ms. Don Fitch. So it has, I would say for the newcomers, Carol, can you see? You can't really, huh? Not really. Okay. Thank you for being honest. I would say for the newcomers that um, my boundaries is kind of like a Smucker's jelly jar, and, and I make it get six feet tall, big, and it fits around me, and I clean it out really good, and I lift it down over to my over my head and around. And mine is clear. I can see out. You can see in. But it's an external boundary. Smucker's jelly jar. Take the label off so that you can see out really clearly. You can see in. Mine is bulletproof and it's very thick. Yours doesn't have to. Be. It moves out and it moves in. It moves out when I need distance. I pull it in when I want to be close to you. And you know the thing about boundaries that's really intriguing to me is my boundaries change. They're not always the same with any one person. They change. It depends on. Lots of times it's not what you're doing that affects how my boundaries are. It's maybe I'm affected by HALT, uh, the acronym Hungry, Angry, Lonely, Tired, that we learn in um, alcohol recovery. So if I have maybe two out of four, I'm hungry and I'm angry, my willingness to be present with another person or other persons is going to shift. If I'm three out of four, hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, really don't come close to me. And if I'm four out of four, I need, I need, for myself, I need to, hi, come on in. So if I'm four out of four, for me, I need to uh, take care of my uh, relapse clusters. You all know Terry Gorski's stuff, right? So, some do? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I have a set of relapse signs that happens sometimes, um, I have to know what my cluster is, and then I have two or three people who are in my support system, and they confront me in a loving way. This is what I see the behavior, and you've asked me to confront you about this behavior and give you some emotional support. Confronting a person about relapse is not about attacking that person for um, being uh, uh, in some kind of stress in my opinion. Okay, so this is <coughs> the external boundary. It moves in and it moves out. The external boundary uh, has two parts to it. One part is about nourishing, nourishing touch like hugging and holding, and another part is uh, sexual. It's up to me to get both of these components met as they're needed for, as I need them to be met. It's not about for me to get up in the morning and brush Anne Marie's hair, and it's not about for you to get up and to brush my teeth. We're all in this recovery experience together to take care of our own needs. <coughs> um, what we can do is we can ask for help <coughs> and not be ashamed of asking for help if, um, when I was still suicidal, two or three or four years into recovery, I began to ask for help. Actually, I asked for help all the way along. The problem was the people I was asking for help didn't know about CODA. They didn't know about um, that I didn't have a self and that I was very young um, emotionally. Um, so the people that I went to for help really didn't know how to help me. They wanted to. It was like my parents didn't mean to abuse me. And 
when I say that, I mean child abuse is anything less than nurturing. I'm not talking about overt forms of abuse only, whereas physical abuse, sexual abuse, intellectual abuse, emotional abuse. But also, um, if I were to be neglected as a child, that is also what I consider abuse. Abusive. Just for fun, uh, Sandy, would you be willing to kind of stand over there? Are you willing? Okay. And just kind of, um, for the newcomers, stand over this way. Show them what it would be like uh, if we were to set an external boundary with each other. Move slowly and move in. Where are you comfortable standing? Right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sandy's pretty comfortable standing close to me, and, and that's probably because we're, we're buddies from uh, the homeless shelter and recovery friends. So stand back and let me share where my, a little bit more, let me share, this is how I find out where my boundaries with people. I look the person in the eye, and if it's uncomfortable for me to look you in the eye, then I look you in between your eyes and your forehead. And it's a feeling. This boundary situation isn't necessarily um, a set experience. Because I am sober and clean and uh, addressing my uh, eating disorders, my sex and love addiction, my workaholism, my gambling, my risk taking, even though I don't go to Las Vegas, I take risks. So I'm addressing those aspects of myself. I get to tumble and fumble and fall into the moment. And so once I am in the moment, I use my feelings as tools to tell me what's comfortable and what's not comfortable and what's safe and not safe. And my boundaries is part of my tools that I have in my toolkit. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm looking at Sandy and I start walking close to her. And when my energy my energy around me says this is a comfortable space. That means that this is the distance between us that's comfortable for me. And the way I tell who gets, who's, Sandy's boundaries is much closer, but her boundaries are closer here with me, mine is farther apart. The way I tell how much space we need in between us is the person who has the greater need for space. So I'm honoring myself. I'm honoring Sandy. Thanks, Sandy. Okay. Anybody have any questions about setting the external boundary? It's not consistent. The external boundary moves. If I'm in hungry, angry, lonely, tired, halt, I may not want to be close to you. It's not about you. It's because I have things going on inside me that I'm unable to be emotionally present or physically present. Sometimes it could be about you. If you were threatening me or if you were calling me a name, I don't think I would want to be close with you. I've also had times myself when someone would just walk in the room. I mean, somebody I don't even know. And all of a sudden, I'll feel real prickly like a, a porcupine. Something about that person just doesn't feel comfortable. I'm really glad you're sharing that, Sandy because pass this around. I think our energies can be organized. And you know, people are, if you look at us as radiant energy, and sometimes the energy is kind of porcupine -ish, we can poke each other. We want to be close with each other. We want to experience love and acceptance, but sometimes we can poke each other. The reverse of that is looking at that emergent or radiant energy. When you feel that, when that goes around, when you feel it, imagine that that's a positive energy, a loving energy. Mm -hmm. And I've had experiences where people <coughs> walk into the room and I feel like I've known them all my life. Anybody here? Have you had that? It's not necessarily true. That's why fooling feelings can be, can fool me. They're not necessarily reality but they're a guide for reality, for me. What I intuitively sense between my thinking and my feeling tells me possibly what's safe and what's not safe. I've also had a walk in the atmosphere and all of a sudden form the atmosphere will turn ice cold. 
like an unearthly cult. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Sandy. Internal boundary is the external boundary works with the internal boundary. Together they make up a boundary called the spiritual boundary. The external boundary won't work unless my internal boundary is set in place, in my opinion. And I learned this from Pia. So the internal boundary is kind of like a Dennis flap jacket, except it has little doors on it. And only I can open the doors. I open them in if I want to feel, and I keep them shut if it's not appropriate for me to have feelings. Uh, at the moment, in the moment. So the internal boundary is not about protection and containment. The internal boundary is about my thinking, aspects of my reality, which is my thinking, my feeling, and my behavior, or my actions or lack of actions. Sometimes there's not a lot that I can do. When I first discovered my childhood and really got a substance for my childhood, I was with my lover sitting, uh, waiting for her. I was out in front of 7-Eleven in Poway. And I was in, in the car. She was in getting something. We had a horrendous argument over what kind of car I was going to buy. And uh, I heard this little child in the car next to me crying because her mom had gone into 7-Eleven. I'm talking right now about behaviors. Sometimes there's not a lot that we can do. So I'm hearing this little child cry, and I really got a feel for what would that have been like for me if I was left in a car someplace weeping and didn't know where my mom or my surrogate parent had gone. And, um, and I felt fear. And so I thought, you know, Dawn, you have five years in recovery now, four years in recovery. What could you do in this situation? So what I decided to do was say to the little girl, she couldn't see me, she was below the seat. So I said, uh, I, I know that you're really scared. <laughs> and and I, saw, I saw her little head, you know. <laughs> and then I thought about what Bradshaw says about how our higher power is our parent, you know. That, that, I mean, you know. And so there wasn't a lot I could do, but because of my recovery background, what I could do was say, I know that you're really scared, and I want you to know that Mom is going to be back. Your mom is coming back. She went in the store, and she will be back. Now, that wasn't a lot. No big deal to most of us. But if you had been that two or three year old sitting in the car, that was significant to her. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't know what the outcome is. All I know is that from moment to moment, because I'm not loaded or I'm not using some kind of addictive process or mental illness or physical illness not to feel my feelings in the moment, opportunity is always coming and I'm always reaching out. So there are there's a path that we can choose of opportunity. And so because of my recovery background, I can say things I know to use. At that time, I didn't know that that was giraffe talk, what I was doing with that little girl, but that was definitely empathic listening. She was crying and screaming, and I was able to give her a few moments of comfort and support. Okay, any questions so far? <coughs> I've had people tell me that they, they see me as unapproachable. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a boundary that I set? Or is that just Who's telling you that? Yeah. I just heard it. Okay. At times. Mm -hmm. From what you and I have shared, uh, the system of the control and the shame, I'll call it the patriarchy, male control, has uh, uh, really injured you. And then what they did after they injured you was blame you for them injuring you, which is part of the whole syndrome of incest or molest of children. They blame the victim. When the victim accepts that blame, then the oppression is complete. So in defense, 
of yourself, you may be uncoachable. And I would say that you learned your survivor skills really well. And then once I have boundaries, I can begin to go inside. It's an inside job live the steps of the 12-step programs, begin to build integrity from the inside out, begin to experience dignity because I have boundaries, because I have integrity today. I am a person of substance, of 12-step values, and I can begin to be selective of who I share my time with, who I don't share, and also when I'm sharing. It's inside. It's how you feel. Apparently, someone wanted to share with you and you were unable. So what you might think of saying to the person is, you know what, I really see that you want to connect with me, and I would like to be able to connect with you. Would you be willing to um, share with me in an hour, or when I feel differently, maybe within the same day, but would you be willing to share whatever you want to share with me after a while? And then go someplace and meditate. If you really want to make a connection, then it's up to you. We can change from moment to moment mm -hmm. where our boundaries are going to be. I guess what I'm asking, is this something that you wanted to approach me and then you saw that you couldn't from a distance? It wasn't at that moment because I, from a distance I've observed that there, there are many times throughout the day that I look at you and you appear to be unapproachable. And at that particular moment, I guess, but, but if you don't try to approach, how do you know it's unapproachable? Right. Just, She's into reading good. minds. I love this. Okay, I love this because that's where I come from. Well, no, because I had approached her a couple times. She wasn't like rude or it wasn't, yeah, you know, it was right. just, I could tell right. she wasn't. So you were reading physical. And what we need to do is ask. We mm -hmm. need to open our mouth and say, um, I'm not certain that this is a comfortable time to share right now. Could you tell me? We need to do that. Because where I come from, my parents read my mind. Mm -hmm. And they told me what I was thinking and what I wasn't thinking. What was appropriate to be feeling and what wasn't appropriate to be feeling. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've had people come say that I was unapproachable too. And you know, and that sometimes hurts me because they haven't even tried to, you know, I'm not aware of the, the time that they've tried to approach me, you know. Mm -hmm. And it hurts mm -hmm. me. So what I'm hearing you say is that you're allowing your internal boundaries to be affected by someone who hasn't really, that's that's not about them, that's about you, because it's up to me to be able to say, I didn't even know you were trying to approach me. Oh, so that's so why you have to say? Yeah, I could say, isn't that interesting? If you want to approach me in the future, will you let me know? <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, see, because I've done the same thing as both these two, and carried a step further where somebody will come up to me and tell me that I that I'm unapproachable, and I am unapproachable, but I want to be approached. But I'm putting using that as a defense, so that therefore I don't have to be rejected. No, I got a lot to say about that on giraffe talk, okay. and I'm going to talk about that in a little while. For the newcomers, let me run through this. In between my internal boundary and my external boundary is my higher power. As I understand God, her, him, source, force. This is step one, two, and three of the 12-step program. Or step 10, 11, and 12 of the 12-step program. This is not about your higher power or how you would like me to have my own higher power. The 12-step self-help program is an inside job. We, we define our own higher power. So this is God as I understand God, which is step one, two, and three. In between my internal boundary, or 10, 11, and 12, and my external boundary is God as I understand her, him, force, or source. When I was a kid, my parents controlled me. This God also is not me, you, husbands, partners, Parents, kids, teachers, friends. This, when I talk about higher power, I really mean higher power. I'm talking higher power. And not some science fiction thing from Star Trek. I'm talking higher power. Very, the the 
state the impact of higher power in my life today. The way I have experienced higher power is watching the apparent miracles work within 12 step, the lives of 12 step people. Do we have somebody new in here? Oh, Troy. See you later. So, um, okay, so higher power, I really mean higher power. Now, what happened when I was a kid is that I thought my parents were my higher power. And they controlled me by shaming me, blaming me, rewards and punishment. And the biggest of all of this could also be threats in here. The biggest of all of this was they made me guilty. I never really got a chance to be a precious child. I, I, went, I went straight from cesarean section to being a tiny adult. I went straight to being controlled. That's why it was so difficult for me in recovery. I had to go back to my beginning. Well, my beginning was a little tiny infant self. I was still working on trust, zero to six months, in the Bradshaw sense. I didn't have a substance of myself. So, when I'm talking higher power, I don't mean control higher power. This higher power loves me for dawn. This higher power, I'm hoping that you develop, loves you for you as you are, as the preciousness of who you are, without any kind of performance or without any kind of uh, pretense. Because the deal in recovery is that there is no deal. It's just us here in the moment. <coughs> With a lot of choices now, God bless you, about what I'm going to do in my recovery and what I'm not going to do in my recovery. I like being here with you all. I like watching you cry. Not that I enjoy your pain. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that I really admire your courage to step out of a patriarchal control system that has really injured all of us here and to become self-determining so that we can choose not to take a drink one moment at a time or we can choose what our life is going to be, uh, how we're going to create our life. We're at choice today. Isn't that exciting, JJ? I mean, wow, talk about being empowered. So much different from, I've crawled down, like Eric Clampton says, I found myself crawling down the streets and nobody knew my name in my, in my addiction. I mean, not a pretty sight. So, and that's not me today. Any questions on this? Higher power is really important. When you're into love addiction or sex addiction, the best prayer that has always worked for me is falling on my knees and saying, God, help me. Help me get over this obsession. And if you have to say it, and I've said it 30 or 40 times in one sitting on my knees, at the end, the feeling will change and I'll get through the obsession. And eventually I don't have to do that anymore because my choices are so refined today that I don't make the kind of inappropriate um, choices that led me to that terrible pain to begin with. Okay, so this is internal, external boundaries, higher power. Why is this important? This is important, in my opinion, to me. You know, I said yesterday, uh, whenever we last talked, last week, that girl children were not celebrated. And yesterday I was, uh, I was having a, a, uh, a, another exam for, I had two biopsies and I'm having another one Friday for this cancer I got in my mouth. And I was reading this article on a 12-year-old who is uh, Ho Chi, over in Ho Chi Minh City. And she's got a little wedding dress on. And the wedding dress is, uh, 
with bare feet in hopes that she will find someone who will marry her and take her out of poverty. And what happens with these children, they are not celebrated. So I made a mistake last week. Children right now today, girl children, are not necessarily celebrated. And this whole article, there's four pages, it's from um, Time. It says, Sex for Sale. This whole article is on young girls, 12 or younger, who are sold to brothels for prostitution all over in different parts of the world. They're transported to different parts of the world where they can't understand the language, and there is no way out. 